but you know, and, and I do it. Obviously, you know, I, I look at them a lot. I look yeah, at them a lot. Um, you do, and I've had really good success looking at them. You know, I think I've kind of maybe started to get a little bit of a reputation of being a, a side fisherman, mm -hmm. you know, like a guy that people know around here for side fishing because it, it's not for everybody. I, I, I agree. I'm with well that. aware of that. Like, there's some people that get in my boat. Side fishing is not really their deal. I've kind of reached the point at this point. I've been guiding enough years now and. Uh, like I said, people kind of know that I like to side fish yeah. a lot because I do it so much. Well, most of the people that book me are booking me way in advance during side fishing season, and they're booking to come side fish. Right. So I don't really run into that too much anymore. But there's definitely some people that are getting your boat that, you know, and it's not even all about ability. You know, I said, you know, your customers aren't able to. Your customer being able to is not necessarily about his uh, technical ability of pitching and flipping or any of that. Sometimes it, you have people that just aren't mentally made up to bed. Right. Because it's a for different sure. deal. Yeah. You're sitting there on one fish sometimes for 15, and you don't think 15 or 20 minutes seems like a long time until you're staring at one fish and you've made 100 flips in 15 minutes, mm -hmm. or 50 flips, or whatever it is. You know? like then it starts to seem like a long time, 15 minutes can be long. Uh, and sometimes, you know, especially on big fish, 30, 45 minutes, an hour plus, or if it depends on how big she is. I mean, I spent, me, myself, personally, fishing for myself until the bed, I spent over four hours one time looking at one I thought it was 15 pounds, trying to catch her. Wow. And the closest I ever got was she bit the back end of my bait and ripped, when I slipped the hook, ripped the tail off my bait. Wow. But to me, I didn't care about any other fish that flew been. Sure. I knew where there was Absolutely. one that was the biggest thing I'd ever seen and I, I had to catch her. And, and the thing that I love about sight, like, I'm never more exhausted after a day of fishing than I am during sight fishing season. And, and I'll tell you, my belief is the reason why is because you're always in the game. Like, when you're fishing, there's times when you're just got to jump and or you're pitching and flipping and sure. Yeah, you're focused and you're fishing hard and you're paying attention, but you're not like bird dogged up on your toes, making flip, 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 flip. I mean, when you're sight fishing, you're mentally and physically tense and in the game the entire day. Uh, and you can see that fish and you can see it react. Um, I think one of the biggest mistakes people do make, though, is they get too worried about seeing the fish. I say all that to say that really the way to have success sight fishing, more especially on a pressure lake like Lake Fork, is to not see the fish you're sight fishing for. Absolutely. I try to not see every fish the first time I flip it. I try, don't want to see it. Like when I can see a fish before I flipped it the first time, I feel really uncomfortable. I'm like, uh, I'm gonna try this. I don't think it's gonna work. Like that's how I feel. You know what I'm saying? Oh, absolutely. 100%. So my deal is I'll go by and I'll, I'll get up close to it. I'll see them. And I'll kind of gauge their behavior, and I'll see, you know, how fast does this fish leave the bed? How soon does it come back? Uh, just kind of the general attitude. Does that fish seem like it really wants to stay around that spot, or does that fish seem like it's okay with bailing out? Because yep. that's the decision we all got to make. Every, excuse me. Yep. You definitely got to judge their personality and how they're acting. You got to make a decision on every fish you see on the bed. You got to make the decision: is she catchable or is she not? And is she worth the time it's going to take to catch her? That's the thought process you have to go through. And so how that fish leaves the bed when you roll up on her, if you get close to her, how she leaves that bed and how fast she comes back and her attitude and demeanor are all clues that can tell you uh, how long this fish should take you to catch her if you do your job. But what I'll do is I'll go up there and I'll gauge her behavior. If I deem it's a fish that I think is good enough and catchable and worth spending time on, I'll, I'll mark a few of them and then I'll flip back and go back to that first one. And when I power pull down the first time, I'm way back. And there's a few things that are important. Uh, wind angles, sunlight angles, which change hour to hour throughout the day, uh, for the glare, the glare that it creates in the water. So you got to approach the fish with the right sunlight angle to be able to see it. Because depending on the glare on the water, you might have a fish that you can see from 20 feet away uh, with one angle, and then move over a few feet, and you can't see the fish from five feet away. And that's a very real thing. So you have to be concerned. Trying to, you know, obviously the more wind ripples, the harder it is to see them. Uh, the sunlight glare is something I don't think nobody really spends enough time. Your average guy doesn't spend enough time considering the sunlight angles when he's approaching a fish. So when I'm going in there to sit up on her, I'm going to be thinking about that, okay? Oh, yeah. Like, I'm, what I'll actually do is I'll actually, as I'm rolling up to her, I'll start doing this. And I'm looking around and say, okay, what's the cleanest angle I got? Like, what has the least yeah. glare on the water? What can, I, what can I see the furthest into the water at right now? And then I want to be lined up on that same angle on that fish. And it's super important when you're just looking down the bank. You know, if you're going yeah. down the bank. You want to go that, right way down the bank. Yeah, you're looking, you're looking into a glare for, you know, 100 yards. And you turn around and you come back and you're like, oh, man. I missed everything. I, I missed everything. Now I've already motored mile and 
you know, our love. and it, it's that's that's a good point. You know, I, I yeah. don't know that. I, you know, I think I probably you and I think about it without thinking about it. Yeah, I don't know that everybody does. That's, that's, I, I, it seems like a lot of people get on a boat and leaving. They're like, man, I can't see that fish. I'm like, well, it's because you're standing three feet from the rock. Right. But over here, sure. they don't even know that's yeah. the reason. I mean, there's times where I'm pinned up on a bed, and I'm 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 walking all the way down my boat trying to make sure I got the. Best. Oh yeah. You yeah, know, I got the best. That's one other thing is I approach a fish. Now sometimes you can't do it depending on the depth of the water, but when I have the ability to, I want to point my nose of the boat at the fish. So if, if I'm look if I'm trying to get this angle on the fish and I'm going this way down the bank, I'm gonna swing my boat around and come at it this way and power pull down. Because I want my boat I want the profile of my boat to be as narrow as possible. To me it's just like we saw the guys on tour getting down on the knees. Sure. To me turning the boat nose forward is the same thing. I'm trying to lessen the profile that the fish can see. If the fish can see 20 feet of boat, to me that's worse than him being able to see, what is it, 90 inches yeah. of boat. Yeah. It's just like the standing up and kneeling. Sure. You're just trying to make it smaller. Because that fish is looking through that prism of that breaking that surface line of that water. And if there's something huge there, it's going to be a wholly different deal than if, if he's looking at it head on. So I'll, I think about wind angles, sun angles. Uh, I think about the boat positioning is so important. I think about getting the you know making the boat narrower if I can. Uh, and then the big deal is as I approach that fish, I'm going to make sure the power pull down as soon as I can see the bed. Don't need to see the fish. Don't need to know if the fish is in there or not. As soon as I can see any shadow of the bed. So let's say the, the ground's kind of dark and the bed is bright, which happens most of the time. Sometimes the ground will be light colored and the bed will be dark. That happens sometimes out here. Uh, but whatever the bed is, as soon as I can see the very, just barely make out the outline of that bed, dropping the sticks. I don't see a fish. I'm not close enough to see a fish. That's where I want to stop. Then I'm going to pitch well past the bed if I have the opportunity to. I'm going to ease that bait. I'm going to swim that bait right on the surface. As soon as it gets to the back part of the bed, I'm going to point my rod, drop it, and now I'm just going to start shaking. Now I'm going to shake it pretty aggressively the first couple of times because I'm trying to make that fish move so I can see it. So if that fish is in there, if I'm hopping the bait pretty good and just kind of pop, 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 making that bait do this in the bed, it's going to make that fish either spin or leave. And if she leaves, no big deal, she'll come back. If she's catching one, she'll come back. But I want that fish to move. And now when that fish moves, I can see it. Because if it's sitting on the edge of something dark or something, I see it. But if that fish moves or turns up on its side, now you'll see it. Yeah. And once I've seen her move, what I'm going to really pay attention to the most is where did she move from? Because when I'm way out off her and the first pitch I'm making there, wherever she started, that's where she wants to be. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, she wants to be spot. That's, that's the, everybody talks about finding the spot. Well, let me tell you the secret to the spot. It's where the fish is sitting before he knows you're there. That's the spot they're wanting to defend. That's the spot they're comfortable with. That's the spot they're going to come bite you at. So I pay real close attention to my first flip. Wherever that fish moved from, that's where I'm going to work. Even if that fish wanders out here, I'll still work that spot. And usually I can get them, even if they wander out here, to come back if I got my bait in that spot. Now, there are some fish that are a little unique that will just kind of get out there and stay out there. If they get hard-headed on you, they get out of the bed and they just kind of stay out there, then I'll pitch past them and try to bang them around a little bit. Not like hit them real hard, I'm not doing this, but just kind of tickle their ears is what I like to call it. Just get up there and just kind of hop that bait up into their side, and that'll usually kind of nudge them and they'll get back on the bed for you a lot of times. Sometimes it'll make that fish completely leave, and if that fish completely leaves, you won't catch him anyway. So it's still good to kind of force that fish into a decision right there. Um, that's, I think... That initial approach and being able to see that fish from a greater distance and locate the area it wants to defend and all that stuff that I just went over, to me that's the difference between being able to catch, especially on a lake like this, because these these ones that are obvious. Man, oh they, yeah, they especially get, with the falling water, they get caught so many mm -hmm. times and get fished for so hard. Uh, you need to be able to a find some fish a little bit deeper, find some fish that others miss. And the ones that everybody can't see, you need to be able to fish for them differently. Yeah. You need to be able to stay further off and make them more comfortable. If you want to catch them, you got to make them more comfortable uh, with all the pressure these fish get. And I hear guys say, man, I was going out sight fishing, I just couldn't get any on the bottom. Well, it's because you're doing it wrong. You go up there trying to count every spot on that sucker and then drop it on his head every yeah. time. And you, you got to, you know, the more pressure these fish get, the more sensitive they're going to get to your presence. And you really got to be careful about how you do that. You know, and there's another thing, you know, you talked about them kind of rolling on the bed, and a lot of times what I'll do uh, is, is, like you said, it's, it's it's such a critical part. We talked about it with Luke Duncan, you know, and um, speed and efficiency, in my opinion, are by far the most important thing Boy, in bed fishing, you know. That's the next thing you get into, because that's, that's the next, I mean, that we just, 
everything I just did that, that's just the initial approach. Yeah, that's just, that's just approach. All, all that's reading the fish. Now we gotta catch them. Yeah. And so what you you're know, talking about is the most important part of catching. And, and what I'll do a lot of times, that fish that swims out and sits over there, I'll get that bait in the back of the bed, which is a, a big deal, you know, getting that cast past it, super subtle, pulling it back before it sinks into the grass, whatever it is, hits the top of the water, you pull it, and you drop it before it glides to the front of the bed. You drop it at the back of the bed. And so then what I'll do is I'll throw it out there, I'll hold my rod tip over, I don't move the bait, let that fish get back, and then I'll start kind of coming around. And I know you do that, obviously we both do that. Yeah. That's, that's pretty simple yeah. stuff. But it's a big deal a lot of times. A lot of times yeah. that bass comes back, and it, it will it will get up. In fact, it surprises I almost in there. want it's that to happen when a fish isn't super locked on. I want her to give me a minute to get that bait in there. Yeah. And she comes through, and I do the same thing. I think we all kind of do. We do that. We do a hop with slack. You go, you slap that rod, and everything is jiggling. Everything's popping. If she's there and you're near, it's going to jump up, slap her. And if it slaps her, it's probably a caught fish. Yeah. Um, uh, but let's talk more about when they get when you get up there and you're looking down. What's what's kind of the approach now? Yeah, so I mean, what you said, the the, the uh, I think when we talked about with Luke on that podcast episode, Luke's a really good fisherman, really good fish, and he loves to sight fish. That's his favorite way to do it too. Um, it, it, it's about accuracy and repetition, and that's what you guys said in that podcast. I thought you said that. I thought it was really well put. Uh, accuracy is so important because the deal is once I know where that fish wants to sit. I gotta put that bait basically where that fish's head is. I gotta tell my wife why I'm not at my house. Hmm? I gotta tell my wife uh, why I'm not at home. Tell me with your girlfriend. That, that she used to hear that by now? She used to hear that by now. Yeah, that's what I'm The accuracy and repetition. And, and that's so well said. It just says exactly what it has to be. I mean, you have to be so accurate. I mean, basically, once you figure out, like, using the approach tactics that I use, once I figure out where that fish wants to be, I've gotta put that bait right behind his head. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna put it in there soft, I'm gonna put it in there quiet. I'm gonna tell you how to do that here in a minute. But you gotta get it in there and get it right behind his head in the spot, really, on most fish, about about that big is what you're looking for. So the accuracy of that, and then, and then the repetition comes in of the speed of getting back in there, right? Like, so the accuracy is important, and then when you pull, when the fish kind of does this, you get to work the bait past the fish, and you pull the bait out. The faster and quieter you get it back on that exact same spot, the faster you mm -hmm. catch that fish. Absolutely. So many times with customers, what happens is I'll make the first few flips and I'll get that fish to go on. And it, it's, that bait's coming in and out, in and out, in and out. Fast that bait's coming out, it's going right back in. And that fish, and I'll have them fired up in three or four or five flips sometimes. And then I'll let my customer have the go. Yeah. Okay, okay, buddy, she's locked in. Yep. Throw it right here. And they may make an accurate pitch. And they'll go to shake it and they'll work it. And then they'll get that bait and they kind of take the time or the other end. Get the grass off real quick. They pitch it over there yeah. and let it fall in the grass and hop it out before it gets yeah. in the bed. And like, Listen, I'm not knocking them. They, they don't know. You know, they don't know. And I, I try to express it to them that, you know, it's important, how important it is to get that bait back in there. And then I hate doing that because then I feel like when they feel like I'm trying to make them hurry, they make less accurate pitches. Yeah. And I'd rather you put it on the right spot than take too much heat and take a little more time. But you know what I mean? Sure. So it's kind of a side fishing is a really touchy deal with customers. I'm telling you, I don't think I understand why you don't do a lot with customers. I don't think it's for I think it, a it's not for every person, and b I don't think it's for every guy to be a side fishing guy. Sure. I think it takes a certain uh, and it's probably fifty fifty out here. Mentality. You got about fifty percent of the guys that do it, and yeah. not, or you know, maybe even less. There's probably not a whole lot out here that actually side fish. You know, there's, I, th I would say there's a handful of guys that pretty much do sight fishing predominantly. Exclusively, not, almost. Maybe not exclusively. Almost. But if you got some light and there's fish on beds, yeah. they're sight fishing. Right. You know, like there's about a handful of guys that are pretty much all in. And there's so many times, especially out here, that you got to sight fish. You kind of have to. There's times when you get it, like when those guys were there, there's so many of them jumping up on beds, yeah. you just weren't going to catch very many or anything else. Right. And when the fish start getting locked on a bed, if you're not sitting there flipping it over and over, it's hard to catch. Like mm -hmm. it can be hard to catch sometimes. So, um, but that action repetition is a big deal. Now, one of the things that you just mentioned that's really important to me is throwing that bait past the bed, landing soft, and then getting that bait to swim up by the surface and fall in the back of the bed. Fast. So I want to do a couple of technique things tonight. I want to show these guys the, the proper technique to get that bait from behind the bed, from well behind the bed, sometimes 10 or 15 feet. You throw way past it, that's fine. But get it there to the back of the bed fast, quiet, and accurately. And, and if we, we, we said earlier that my thumb is my drag, but this is the only mention, I call it the thumb drag. And so we'll pitch our bait out there. Pitch our bait out there, switch hands, and then actually you don't switch hands. So you, you pitch your bait out there, and, and when your bait hits water, you thumb the sport. The deal is instantaneously, I pitch, 
And as soon as my bait hits the water, as soon as I throw my spool, I start lifting my rod. So that's the deal. So I'm kind of doing it from an awkward position here, but I flip it, thumb, and drag. Yep. And when I thumb and drag, what I'm doing is as soon as that bait hits the water, I hit my thumb, I immediately start lifting my rod. That bait will hit that surface quiet because I thumbed it and eased it in there. And then as soon as I start lifting my rod, that bait's swimming. And I can see it. Yep. I can visually right. see it swimming right on the surface. And I've got the back of the bed. And now if I miss my line a little bit, I can steer it while I'm dragging. So while I'm lifting and dragging, I can go this way. Lifting and dragging, go this way. I can steer it to the exact spot I want. I mean, I can get it right here. And as soon as it's even on the back of the bed, you just drop your rod tip. And it creates all that slack and the bait falls right in the back of the bed. You know, and I, uh, I tell people, I'll, I'll go pull your rod to the left. And yeah. I mean that rod's seven, eight foot long. Dude, you can change you the can direction. Change the direction yes. quick, you know? and yes. you make a you make a less than accurate flip, but you're five, eight, ten foot past the, the hot spot, you can point your rod and all the way it. to the left and pull it over. And that's another thing about your approach and setup is give yourself if you have the opportunity with the right light angle, give yourself the opportunity on the angle to be able to. That's get a really big deal. Angle. There's a lot of times where, especially right now with the lake kind of high. You gotta, you gotta you have to fish a from a certain angle to yeah. actually be able to make the cast. That's right. We had one today that had a, uh, uh, the, the bed was kind of out off the bank in a real shallow flat. It was right up next to a reed clump on the right hand side, and then kind of right behind it, there was this just little bushy limb that was laid down sticking out of the water a little bit. And you had to throw past it and drag over that limb, and I went, man, we're done. Why aren't we just over there? Yeah. We can throw in between yeah. the reed and the wind. Oh yeah. And we sat there probably for 15 minutes trying to catch this <laughs> four or five pounder, uh, dragging it over that wind. And we were getting the spin. He just couldn't get it to commit. Then we went over there from the right angle and like three catches. Yeah. So had it. Yeah. You know. So it's that important. It can go from a fish that you either don't catch or it takes you 45 minutes to catch, and that same fish might take you three flips. Like it can yeah. be that important. Sure. Uh, and dude, angles in fishing. In, in fishing general, in general, in sight angles fishing, can be a big deal. And the only difference in sight fishing is so precise. It's so minute. The angles get so sharp yeah. and tight. Um, now, the other thing is, you said you walk, we all kind of do the same thing. I have a few things, and, and you know, I get to talk to my customers every day about it, so I've kind of got some terminology that I've come up with for it. And this is stuff that, you know, I, nobody taught me. The only person that taught me anything about bed fishing was Steve Hodge, who's a great local tournament angler out here, and one of the better bed fishermen. He really is good. Uh, he sent me an article that he wrote on bed fishing years ago when I first moved back here. Uh, that kind of gave me, when I was just kind of really learning how to, I mean, I've I bed fished before, but when I was really getting into the fighting aspects of bed fishing, this really got me a good base and foundation. But other than that, everything I know about bed fishing is strictly trial and error. It's visually throwing baits in beds, changing baits, doing different things, and all that stuff. So. The actions that I will put on the bait are, are such. I have a few of them. So we'll pitch it in there. I gave you the thumb drag. Now the bait's in the right spot. Once that bait's in there and that fish is looking at the bait, or he's close to the bait, he's around the bait, he's coming back in, uh, we're going to have a shake. And one thing we got to talk about on a shake is what people don't realize is when I say shake, most people think do this. See, my hand's not moving much. Right. My hand's not moving much. But folks, look at what the rod's doing when I do that. So you do the old slap or do you do the old No, there, I right do, here. the deal is that rod is moving. Right, it's moving forward. the bait. So that bait is yeah. doing this. Well, there's times when I want that bait to just kind of tremor mm -hmm. in the bed. And so what I'll do is just, I mean, it's just a much light, like you can't even see my hand. So when I'm shaking, so when I'm side fishing, I'm shaking a little bit of this. I mean, you, you see my hand moving? My hand's you're, not moving. You're, you're making the clacking. My hand's not moving. Yeah. But the rod tip, okay, when I'm doing that, the rod tip's just, and I can't get it from the single fast. But the rod tip is basically doing this. Right. And that's all I want that rod tip to do. Pay attention not to your hand, folks. Pay attention to your rod tip. Because your rod tip, if your rod tip is moving and you're shaking, your rod tip's moving this much, that bait's moving that much. And that's a problem. Um, so it's a real light shake. I think most people, almost 99% of people give up the first time they shake it way too much. Yeah, they pull it out of the bed usually. They, they hop it, hop it inside yeah. the bed. They get two or three hops and they're out of the bed. <laughs> you know? um, now, there is a hop. I'll tell my customers, and I'll show them, I'll teach them all this, I'll say, okay, shake it. I'll say, hop it. A hop it is just one, yep. and it's just a snap. You just want to pop your rod about six inches to a foot, just one little sharp snap, but the big deal is you just snap the slack, like you talked yep. about on frog, you don't pull through it. You just snap the slack and point your rod right back down. And it's going to make that bait sit there and it's shaking, 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 and, yep. and it goes, it's just one time. And that's what if a fish is sitting up high and not nosing down, but it's kind of staying around the bed, 
hop it to try to get it up in that fish's face. And a lot of times, if they don't catch it, they'll follow it back down. Yeah. And it'll get them to start nosing down and get more aggressive. So that's that's a technique I use. Uh, I do do the rattle. I figured you were shaking. But I don't do it like Justin Rackley. A good, you know, I had great guy. Buddy of mine, Justin Rackley, he gets over here and he, I mean, he beats the fire out of it, dude. I mean, he gets the whiffing on that. I do what I call, but the finesse, I call it the rattle, but I just do a finesse version of what Rackley does. So I'll get that bit in there, I'll hold my rod still, and just go. It's just a way of me doing the same shape, just yeah. doing it faster. I can speed it up. And I can really get this bead, and we'll talk about this setup in a minute, but I use a bead, and it really gets this bead to go in. Like just that, like real, real fast. And I typically do that when a fish won't come on the bait. Like right. if a fish is on the bed, I pitch it in there and it swims out, which is common, and he stays outside the bed and he just won't come in. Right. Before right. I start right. throwing at him to move him, right. I'll hit that rattle real, yep. real, real good a few times. And a lot of times, it'll, it'll make them ease back in that yep. bed. It's like you call them into it. So that's kind of when I use that technique. Uh, and then the last thing that I do that I think is real important that I don't really know, honestly, I don't know, I've never seen anybody else do this. So this, I don't know, maybe top secret guys that we're giving away here, but that's kind of what we do. Is when I have somebody pull the bait out of the bed, I want them to snap the heck out of it when they pull it out of the bed and then burn it in as fast as they yep. can. So you be sitting there, shake, 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 and I'll say, all right, get it out of there. And what I mean when I say get it out of there, or so I say snap it, they, they'll be sitting there, shake, 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 and I mean, I mean smack that rod and then burn it real as soon as you slap it. As soon as you snap it, and what there is, I'll be sitting there doing this, and it goes, shoom! Yeah. And it's like something's running away from the bass. I can't tell you how many times I've had a bass and we're pulling there shaking and the bass is coming up, he's right here, he's right here. And then when we do the snap to get it out of there, it makes him go, <laughs> and chase the bait, and then he spins back around his bedding. It's just all about getting that fish more active, yeah. more, more fire. You get into what I call the cat and mouse, and so. It is like a cat and mouse. Uh, I've heard you say this before, I like it. I, uh, my bed fishing started like, I can't remember how old I was, but I was at Kaufman City Lake, walking around the bank, started seeing them all in the beds. And yeah. that's when I started to figure out. I was fifth grade, fourth grade, something like that. And I read an article later on from Kelly Jordan that taught me a lot about bed fishing. And then as a young 2021 20, going into tournaments, that was the way this is it's a young man's game. I know there's some older guys, but they can't tote the tackle box on these college kids when it comes time. These young guys There is a little bit too having dude, you can see better than young. You get a six one college kid that's got twenty twenty vision. I mean he can see an eight pounder on a bed over there. You yeah. know, I've seen them. Yeah. And um when you're younger, you're bed fishing a lot. You know, we did everything. We did the beads, uh, shaky heads, yeah. um, all these other little tricks. The, the thing that I know about bed fish, you got to make them react. Yep. You have to make them react. You, you can throw a you twist in there. To me, the biggest thing is you got to be able to re-engage their temperament and their behavior, and based on their attitude, you got to do what it takes to get a reaction. Yeah. And that's that, that's where experience comes into play. And some of them are they're all different. Some they're of them all need different. to be more aggressive, they're some all of them you need to be less aggressive. It's no different than picking up girls. And uh, <laughs> you got to kind of know the, the amount of subtlety. And so my approach is almost exactly the same. Uh, the snap and reel, obviously, we've talked about that before. I think that's a I really think big, that's deal. A big deal. I do. And, and the reason I do is if that, especially if one nose is down on mine, I'm gone. It's gone. I do the same thing you do. If she starts nosing down and acting interesting, like a pow and burn it in. And but if she shoots after that thing, she's she's done. It's she's done. Gone. She's gone. And so that's why I start to get frustrated that's a good point. fish with other people. Is that fish right? There's two or three little signals she's gonna give me, yeah. and I'll I'll bust out my bank account. We'll go ahead and bet that the next flip that for me usually is gonna be fairly accurate. We're gonna get it in there. We're gonna get it right back here, and then we're gonna pow. And just like you said, that slack line. That slack line does a couple things. It adds a lot of action without a lot of movement. You use that movement uh, without movement. Baby. Movement. So that that stroke crawl, deal, those arms flop. That feeds doing all this crap, and she can't handle it at this yes. point. Um, and so if I've got one that's locked in, it's real simple. This is the fastest, easiest, tournament efficient way to catch these bed fish. You see one that's locked on. She's dumb. She's not biting. She's sitting here just like this. You flip in there, let it drop, and you go boom, 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 boom. And as soon as it goes boom in front of on that slack line, it goes, it hops and furnishes you, you go, and it's done, and you move on to the next one. And a lot of times that's a one, two, three flipper. That's that, that's that one, that's that old dum dum fish. Um, but everything else you said is the same way I approach it. I think any year, and I've talked to all these people that are that are that are really good sight fishermen throughout the years and read articles that we all kind of approach it. We all have our little subtlety differences, and the reality is we know as guys that do it every day, it doesn't matter. The little baits, the all the oh, little things—it doesn't matter. Everything, every changes every year. 
You're throwing a stroke crawl this year that wasn't even out last yeah. year. And so it all works. There's some baits that are really good. That stroke crawl is great. The stroke crawl is good because why some asked me the other day, what would I pick that over a rage crawl? It's, it's, it's simple. Rage crawl creates a lot of drag. When those legs come down, it slows that bait down. There's one thing I don't want that bait to do, and that's move slow. If I want that bait, to, if I now people go, man, should we switch baits? Mm, maybe sometimes I've, I've it had needs it. to be instead of you know something that goes like this, it goes like this. It's just sharp. It's just choo, choo, exactly. Choo, choo, choo. And so Kelly Jordan used to talk about Southern using the sharp low. music. That, but that's what let's talk about the cat deal now because it's all about the cat. It's deal. all about the cat. It's all about it's the cat. All about it's like if you've got a little red laser pointer, and you got your cat. Yeah. You're kind of watering that red laser pointer, and your cat's hunkered down in that hallway, which is the same thing as a bass doing this on your bait. That's a that's a cat in pounce position, and you got that red laser, you're kind of moving it around slow in front of it, and cat might sit there and watch it. If you take that thing, yep. that cat's going to choo! It's exactly It's right. the same deal. And that's why it's so important. We're talking to you guys, we're talking about making quick snaps with our wrist. Yeah. Man, that's such a big deal. I mean, it's it's no different than stroking a jig offshore, twitching a frog, twitching a, It's sudden... Sharp. Or sharp erratic yeah. movements, and in, in this case, it's to make it's to make a flinch without really punching the guy. And it's something I want to go back to something because this is important. I don't want anybody to mess this up, call me and get mad because they hooked the fish in the butt hole. You want to pop that fish from the ear forward. I don't really on the chin, on the nose. Let's talk about the bumping deal because I love the yeah. bumping too. And there's times when you need to bump a fish. Now, it's and there's times when you bump a fish and, and she got will run it. So in general. I want to start in front of the fish's face, finesse, and I'll start accelerating, accelerating, accelerating a little bit at a time, doing more aggressive behaviors until she gives me a negative cue. Right. As soon right, as she gives right. me a negative cue, I dial back down a notch, and that's where I stay. Bro, you're that's at the bar, you're spitting, you're spitting game, you're spitting game, you're <laughs> spitting game. She goes, hold on, my boyfriend's texting me, you're like, hold on, slow down. Yeah. That's the deal. Unless you're me, and you're like, oh, cool. <laughs> that's that's good, you know. And you, you start slow and accelerate up, and part of that acceleration is through that shaking, shaking, shaking. I will do the same thing with the way that I bump them. I'll accelerate how I bump them. So if they're sitting there and they'll they'll stay in that bed, I will start hitting them, and I try to put it right in their ear holes, but across the gill plate. Mm -hmm. I don't really want to hit them from the mid body down in the tail. No, I don't want to do that. That can ruin a fish sometimes, mm -hmm. especially a big fish. Big can ruin. fish will definitely ruin. So I want to try to put it right in their gill plate or their ear hole, whatever you want to call it. And when the first time I throw it in there, I'm going to pitch it past her. I'm just going to kind of just maybe a little bit more than my subtle shake, but just a little shimmy shake and just kind of tickle their ear hole a little bit. And it'll just kind of tickle over. And that usually when it hits them, they'll kind of spin around and do something. Now, if that fish just kind of sits there and lets me do that and doesn't react to that, okay, the next time I'm going to come over there, I'm going to kind of hop it. Hop, hop, hop. And boom, and it'll hit them, and that'll usually make them react. Mm -hmm. And if that doesn't make them react, the next time I'm pitching it in, I'm gonna put it right behind them, and I'm gonna wham! And I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull them right down and snap it and drive that thing into their face, and that'll make them turn. Yeah. And there are fish on Lake Fork that get so used to seeing boats and baits, they will sit there and stare at your bait and not do anything until you. Oh, a lot, of them. a lot of them. But you have to, if you tickle her ear and she goes, Shoo! dude, you better not touch her again. You better keep it in front of her nose and not touch her. If you tickle her ear and she she doesn't do anything, but you hop in, she builds. You better go back to that tickle. You know, and there's 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 a lot to that. So we're looking at a fish, seven eight pounds, or whatever. We need to catch this fish, and we're in a scenario you're talking about. Yeah. We bounce it. She shoots out. There's a couple options there. You can continue to fish the bed, the hot spot, which is key. Or you can also the hardest thing, but you can leave and you can come back later. Good point. Um, a lot of times. It's like checking the oven. You know, there's a lot of times where you don't, you can't do that because the second you move, you know, this ranger over here is going to pull up. But if you have the opportunity, yeah. um, like for instance, when my nephew came over here and made a cleanup for me the other day, I had several nice big fish on beds, and they just kind of maybe I could have spent 30 minutes on, but I'm not going to spend 30 minutes on. Well, he came back that afternoon and said, like, "Dude, they were locked on, man. We just whew, bam, we caught them." You know, and three or four hours later, they were just kind of. No, that's not always the case, especially when you talk about big. Pressured fish, but man, it could be a sunlight, it could be angry, it, it, it could, a, a bluegill just swam through there. Uh, in general, I would say that right now for us around here, typically until you get to about mid April, you're kind of in the typically until you get to about seven, eight days in April, you're kind of in what I would call the earlier stages of the spawn, the first couple waves. Yep. Water's a little so. colder in general. Water's down in, some of the water today was down in the lower half of the 60s still, um, some of it was in the 70s. But when you, when you get that earlier part of the, the, the spawn, as a general rule, we've seen this has definitely happened the last couple weeks here. 
the later in the day it gets, yes. especially the females, the warmer the water gets. The warmer the water gets, you'll have new females show up. You'll have females that were wandering earlier that will lock on, uh, and those fish will get a lot more locked on and aggressive the later in the day it gets and the warmer the water gets. Then once it hits about 435, uh, that water starts to trend back down, they'll kind of cool back off again. But that peak heating point of the day is where they really lock on the best early on in the spot. Now, once we get into May, sometimes the best time to pull up on bed fish is in low light, which yep. you can't really see you very good. It's a little bit of but right now, they are definitely locked on better from like, say, noon to 435. Yeah. And really from about 233 to 5 is when they're really locked on the best. Uh, let's talk about your bait here. Yeah, let's go over the bait, and, uh, and then I think we'll kind of have most of it covered. Um, you know, on Lake Fork, I like to side fish a 20 pound fluorocarbon. A, most of the water ain't very clear. No. It's not very clear, especially right now. Uh, but even the cleanest one on the Lake, it's clear enough to see them good, but it's not real clear, ever. It's no Arizona, nothing like that. You don't need to finesse line these fish. And if I'm going to set the hook on an eight pounder on a short line close to the boat, around stumps and shoreline vegetation, I want some pretty tough line. I don't want to be Same dealing here. with 12-pound, 15-pound line. I just don't want right. it. Some guys do. I don't want to do no, that. I agree with you. One thing I will caution you about, caution you about though, even with 20-pound fluorocarbon, that's a tough line that's hard to break. If you get too big of a rod, sight fishing, and you set the hook on an 8-plus pound fish real, real hard, the you're line's going to break. You're going to break that line. Yeah. Especially if there's any slack in it at all. You're going to break that line. So you need a rod that's got some gift to it. So sure. I think the rod's important for sight fishing. I think, I think the line needs to be big. I think the hook needs to be fairly stout. But I think the rod's important. And I know we may not be able to get this on camera. We'll try sticking back behind us a little bit. What I've got here is a 7.5 medium heavy rod. Uh, I, I tend to like longer rods, especially <coughs> when I'm dealing with big fish close to the boat. I don't have to, I can leave more line out and control the fish. I'm throwing 7 4 medium, maybe. Yeah. And so if you look, that's, you know, yeah. it's got a lot of tip, but it's got a lot of backbone at the yeah. same time. But I just Extra need. fast. Uh, yeah, fast. fast. fast I just need enough tip to be a shock absorber on those right. close hook sets. I don't need a lot. I want a pretty, I mean, I want to drive the nail into yeah. that. 10 pounds. You, show it over, you don't want to overpower your rod. Yeah. But I need, I don't want a broomstick either. Like I need sure. a little bit of gift. So the one I'm using is a 7.5 medium heavy. Um, now the bait itself, man, like Ronnie said earlier, this is a, this is as true as it gets. I'll show it you. It just doesn't, it. it's got a, fat, a quick fall with a lot of action. There's a few things that I want in, in a bed fishing bait, but it can, there's a ton of baits that fit this bill. This is the stroke across from Six Cents Fishing. I think it's a really good bed bait. I will say this, I, I, Everything that's happened the latest is always the best, right? That's just human sure. nature. You know, everything's happened, like LeBron's better than Michael Jordan, right? And that's what everyone wants to say. LeBron's good. Everything that's happened recently is the best. So this is a new bait this year. I feel like I've gotten more first foot bites on this bait than I ever have on any other bait. So I think it's a really good bait. I do too. But I'm not saying there's not other baits that right, are really right. good. Basically what I'm looking for is something very short and compact where the hook will go to the end of the body. See how the hook's real close to the end of my body? Yep. I want something, I want my hook to fit right at the end of that. So something compact, it could be a beaver, it could be a zoom speed crawler, sure. it could be a, a plethora of A things. lot of different creature baits, yeah. But I want it to be compact like that. And then the other thing is I want the appendages to be thin. I want it to be something that will go like this with very little water pressure. Yep. So the rage crawl to me, the, the appendages are a little fatter. Well, the rage crawl, the problem with the rage crawl is when you're making it snap, down. it slows that sucker down. It slows down. And, and it's got those big fatter ends yeah. to the deal. So a rage crawl, if it's just sitting there, you just barely chill it, it won't really just sit there, it won't flutter. Yeah. It kind of just do this right. a little bit versus this. It's all about that speed and that reaction like you're talking about. And you know, there's other baits like a chigger crawl has those fatter legs that kind of do this a little more than this. I want something that has real thin appendages on it. The stroke crawl does. You know, a baby brush hog is a good bed fish bait. It's got those yeah. little thin nails. You know, and that's got a good body. They feel a little bit when they bite yeah. down on it. Yeah, that's good. So that, that's what I'm looking for. Look for short and compact, thin appendages that'll do this without me moving the bait very much, without much water pressure to move sure. the arm. Just moves at a very subtle, subtle rate there. Uh, I usually tend to go with a quarter ounce tungsten. Most of the time, it's kind of the, the weight that I tend to use. Three eighths is fine. Uh, 316 is fine. I mean, I wouldn't go an eighth. I just don't feel like I have as much no. control over the It doesn't fall. You can't get the snap. Yeah, you, you just can't be as accurate. But 
quarter ounce typically I kind of like to start light and go heavier if I need to. I mean, I don't do a half ounce very often. Typically it's a quarter to three inch. I do. I, I'm my bit fishing. I got two rods or seven four mini maybe it's a twenty pound line. Seven speed reels and they both got three eighths ounce. They got the same thing you got on here. Yeah. Exact same thing with three eighths ounce. I mean, the, that's a three eighths ounce. They got the same thing. It, yeah. It, I this got is the same a, reel. This is a three eighths ounce. Yeah. We broke off on one day. That's exactly what I'm, I'm doing. So, but typically I do use a quarter, but I mean, three eighths is fine too. Put a little bobber sock above it, put a bead below it, and I've got these little things called knot shields that I put over my yeah. knot, and that just keeps that bead from hitting my knot. Because when you're doing this a lot, and that bead's getting clipped, bead onto your knot, it can chafe your knot and cause break offs. Uh, the bead, even here, will chafe this line at times after you've caught several fish. After you've caught two or three fish or a couple big ones, you need to retie. Yeah. With a glass bead. A glass bead will cause chafing on your line, it'll cause break offs. Uh, but I think that bead's a big deal. Zach used to talk me that a few years ago. You know, that's old school. That's getting back to like yeah. old, old school lizards throwing them on bed, shaking them and stuff. And and I, I don't think the bait matters. And I, don't I, don't think, I, don't think I know the, it doesn't. I don't think I the color it. matters. Um, I steer away from the white baits because I don't want my customers, or even myself, honestly, I don't want to see the fish eat it. Because so many times the fish will do this and not really yeah, have it. And then you foul them. You foul hook them, or, or you, you swing and miss and scare the fire out of them and run them off. Um, I want myself or my customers to actually feel that fish, bite the bait, hold the bait, and move with it a little bit before they swing. So I use natural colors. A, I do think natural colors get more bites than white bait. I do too. I think there are some fish that will bite a natural color bait that will <coughs> bite a white bait. I don't think there's any fish on this lake that will bite a white bait that won't bite this. I agree. Okay. One little color thing though, and this is just something that's a personal opinion of mine, I think a little bit of red, and I don't mean like red flake, I mean like a hard piece of red. I used to paint, back before I used a bead, I used to hand paint a spray paint can to set them out on the back porch spray on the spray can. I used to paint all my tungsten red for sight fishing season. Mm -hmm. Something about a little hard, solid piece of red to me seems to key those fish. Now I've caught a million fish without a D. I've caught a million fish without red on it at all. It's probably just a confidence deal for me. Sure. Yeah, but I like, like the other day I was fishing with my buddy Zach Watts for sight fishing. And he had a bead, but it was black or gray or something. I was like, no, I like, need a red bead. And that particular day, I happened to be out, out fishing him on the bed fish pretty handily there for most of the day. And he switched to a red bead and he caught a couple. And I was like, see? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, I definitely, I definitely you know, I, I tell everybody like this on something like that is you get a tournament and the guy with the red bead doesn't win. It almost uh, makes you not believe the red bead. I, I don't. I, my beads are all black. But yeah. they're all black in my boat. But I don't, you know, I, I yeah. do throw a bead, though. It's, and the reason I throw a bead is because I don't think it hurts. I think the bead is good for the noise. Uh, the red deal is just kind of a unique deal. And I'll throw a spinning rod too. Now I will throw a spinning rod. On I will not throw a spinning rod. I'll <laughs> throw, I'll I'll throw, oh, I will in a heartbeat. I'll throw uh, um, a light Texas rig, a crawl, whatever, you know. Uh, you still throw a little late four crawl, you know, the little one. Oh, yeah. You still throw it a yeah. lot, cost oh, some yeah. big fish on it. I'll throw that. I'll throw um, a drop shot, you know. And, uh, uh, shaky head. See, and that's one thing that I don't do. For all the bed fishing that I do, that's how I do it right there. Yeah. I don't do anything else. And I don't use any other baits, any other techniques. I do that right there. And I, you know, it, it's got to be a certain situation. It's got to be a bed fish that I need that won't bite, and I don't bite, and I got to catch her. Um, otherwise, I'm throwing and the now, exact same thing. You know, that's a tournament deal. That's a tournament deal. Because because right. when we're guiding, we don't need that. We'll just go find another one. Exactly. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, if that one won't bite, we'll just go find another one. Right. Uh, and that's the kind of luxury we have. But in a tournament, if you've got one five pounder on Lake Tahoe, and you need to catch her, and you have to catch her yeah. to win this tournament, then yeah, you're going to try some different. And I will in that situation too. And but Justin Atkins came there and he cleaned up most of those fish on the spinning rod, which was just stupid. He was, that was really, that he was, was awesome. really, dude, that kid, that catch of that 10 pound on that spinning rod. Hey, dude, that was one of the best fish. Just, the one he lost at Atkins on a bit. I mean, I didn't get to it see looked that. like it was 12 or 13 pounds. You know, the Athens nice. has got some giants in it. Oh, like, I mean, the, my, I've got three funny, 11s out of Athens. What's funny is I fish Athens three times a year, generally, maybe five, some years. Like, not hardly at all do I fish Athens. The biggest fish any customers ever caught me was on like Athens. Yeah. It's, just, it's awesome. It's a great lake. It's got a lot of fish. Um, they're easy to catch. Yeah. It gets a lot of pressure, though. That's the. It kind of holds up to it. It's weird how it holds up to it, but it does. Man, that's been a great talk about. Yep. Uh, two completely different ways of bed fishing. One is not sight fishing, but you are bed fishing. The other one is straight up sight fishing, 
but hopefully some of those tips are a little more advanced and yeah, it'll give you an advantage beautiful. over the other guys that are going down the bank and getting right on top of them. Now that's the deal. This everything that I tried to talk to you guys about tonight was designed to try and help you guys catch fish that other people can't. Yeah, catch fish better. Catch because fish I like I have to catch people that other people can't. Yeah. I have to catch the fish that other people can't fish every day out here. If I'm sight fishing for a living, guy, and I'm putting on people, I have to be able to have other people catch sight fish that other people aren't catching. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Does that make sense? So. It's good stuff. Hopefully that helps you. I wish we had the audience in the test to do questions. Yeah, I love yeah. the questions part, but it's Rona season. Dude, we uh, we actually fished the Rona yesterday. That's pretty cool. The funniest thing was we had a little bit of a group <laughs> trip. Me and Ronnie and John did a little group trip today. And it was supposed to be bigger than it was. Of course, with everything that's going on, not just yeah. the local DFW guys came. The guys didn't travel in. Um, but it was the guys, they, they, they're from Corona. The beer company. They're from Corona. And they work for Corona. That was pretty cool. Yeah. Do you know their company only owns Corona in America? Anheuser-Busch owns at every other place in the yeah, world. They bought, they bought the international, Anheuser, yeah, ABI, awesome. Anheuser-Busch Corporate bought the international rice of Corona. That actually happened when I was in the beer business. That's so I don't know all about that. But yeah, so I'm going to head back to uh, Kent Quarantine here in a minute and uh, yeah. hang out. It's been fun, man. We should wish the audience. Yeah. yeah, it's been awesome. Thank you so much. I know we had a super long day on the water. We all caught them pretty good. We had great days, great time. And uh, appreciate you taking time to hang out with me and yep. talk to the folks at home. Hope you all enjoyed it. Uh, as much as y'all do the ones when we do them live. Hopefully, I don't know, maybe the next one probably won't be live either, but I promise you this, we'll never stop giving you our best effort and working as hard as we can to help you catch more and bigger fish. Uh, I'm so glad, I know Ronnie feels the same way as I do, man. We are so Absolutely. dang grateful that we get to come out here. I mean, look, the, the sun's setting on the lake right now. Like, we were out here all day, we all caught fish, we all caught we'll fish. We'll tomorrow and the next, next day, day. Tomorrow. next day. I mean, we are so grateful for the opportunity that we have to do this every day, and we are well, well, well aware. It's because of each and every one of you that watches the content, that helps grow it, helps yeah. share it. Those of you that call book trips, buy these merchandise. If you like this shirt that Ronnie's wearing, we got it for sale at yourlakefortguide.com. Man, we appreciate everything y'all do to support us so much, so uh, we're going to keep trying to give back. Ronnie, great job. We'll see each and every one of you guys next time right here on Your Lake Fort Guide.